So if there's one lecture, I mean, all of them are, are you know, substantial, but this one is really uh, kind of the meat and potatoes of photography. This is really lenses in some way. I mean, everything's important in the exposure triangle, aperture, shutter speed, and ISO, but lenses kind of have a few different qualities about them that make them a little more complex than than just what shutter speed and ISO are uh, because of the visual changes that happen depending on how you use the lens and what kind of lens you're using. And uh, I'm not going to take for granted that I, I feel like the, the shadow play assignment was amazing. Uh, the, the ones that did it, uh, it really just high quality stuff, really great work. And if I have some time, we'll look over some of those. The reason I'm saying I'm not going to take for granted, I'm not going to take for granted that I feel like, like I've said in the past, I think there are quite a few students in this class that have a pretty solid foundation in photography. Hopefully there'll be a few things today that I'll talk about that might be new or something that might be a little still um, complicated for even some of you that have that experience. But what we're going to talk about today is all about lenses and aperture. And um, that's going to lead into the depth of field assignment. Um, so what's due this Friday is the creative motion assignment. Shadow play was due last Friday. Now we're into creative motion due this Friday. And then next Friday, depth of field will be due. So right off the bat, I'm going to repeat this a few times just because I know this question gets asked a lot. But in the in the in e-learn, you can you can go and I'll just show you really quickly here. In e-learn, you can go into um yeah. Participants can now see your application. Okay, I just want to make sure. In eLearn, you can go into, and at this point, I know most of you know this, but in eLearn, you can go into content. And if you go into content and you go into depth of field, you're going to watch a short part of a video today as well. You can go into depth of field, which is down here. And it's kind of all up here. You can go into depth of field, click that, and it will tell you it's only four images. So when you see this to meet the learning objectives for this topic, you will you know, complete these activities, that kind of thing. In depth of field, it's only four images, okay? That's all you have to do for this. And one album called Depth of Field Assignment or Depth of Field, whatever. I mean, Depth of Field or Depth of Field Assignment is fine, but it's only four images in that album, okay? And I'm jumping a little bit ahead, but uh, a lot of students raise their hand and say, do I need to do 30 and 10? This isn't that kind of assignment. This is a four photograph assignment that is very, very specific. Um, and when I say specific, obviously I mean specific, but I look at your numbers. I look at your, your aperture and your shutter speed when you do this and to make sure that you're doing it correctly. Um, but before we dive too deep into that part of it, we're going to talk a little bit about this, this bigger subject, which is lenses. Um, and I've got what I consider the standard lenses that any professional photographer would use. Okay. And I do have, and I feel like in this class, I have some people that could do this professionally. Um, so what I like to do is share with people who are thinking about that. What kind of lenses do I need? Because I get asked that a lot. What what would I need to go out and do any job just about with, you know, what lenses would I need in my bag? And the thing about it is with lenses, you you can't really just get away with having one lens. Um, there are different situations that demand different lenses. Um, and a lot of that does have to do with the aperture of the lens, the maximum size aperture, and also, of course, the focal length. So I'm going to start at focal length, F-O-C-A-L length, focal length. Um, and what does that mean and why is that important? Um, so in person, I wrote them all down and there is a, it, not all the focal lengths of every lens that's ever existed, but kind of the 
range of focal length lenses. What I'm going to do here is sort of verbally describe it. But the first thing you need to know about the focal length of a lens is basically what it means. It's either how wide of an angle it is portraying when you look through it or how telephoto it is zoomed in. It's called telephoto. So lenses have a wide range of either they can be super wide angle all the way to even fisheye to extremely telescopic like a 600 millimeter lens that just reaches out and, and you can photograph a hummingbird from a football field away, right? So there's a lot of lenses in between, okay? So just for starters, where do we start? I start on the wide side, on the wide angle side, the lower the number of the focal length of the lens, the wider it is. So for example, I have on this, my widest lens, even though it's a, it's a zoom lens, meaning it changes, it gets wide and then it gets zoomed in, right? That's a zoom lens. That means it changes its focal length. On the wide side of this lens, it's 24 millimeters, okay? 24, which is pretty wide. It does what I need as a professional. As a professional, I want, this is considered a, called a 24 to 70, okay? And that's, a, if you look at Google 24 to 70 lens, you'll see all kinds of stuff written about it. It's kind of the prototype photographer's lens, 24 to 70, because you can get wide and take a group shot, you can zoom in to 70 and get close-ups of people, or you can do portraiture with this lens. It's not optimal for that, but it will do it and do a pretty good job. Um, so this is a wide angle lens, 24, but it also goes to 70. Now, there are wider angle lenses, like a 10 or a 12. And now those are considered fisheye. And I'm sure you've heard of that term fisheye, some of you anyway. Fish eye lenses are so wide that they actually start to curve around backwards. I mean, they're so wide that it starts to look like a fish eye. That's why they're called fish eye. Like it starts to distort on the edges. Most professional photographers that I've met or interacted with don't carry one in their bag um, because they're so distorted on the edges that it becomes almost um, surreal in a way. Uh, but they are good for like, if you wanted to do like a psychedelic music video or, I mean, there, there's, there's reasons to have them. They're cool lenses. Um, I don't have one personally. I've shot with them before though. But so 10 to 12 millimeters is about as wide as lenses get fisheye. Then it goes to like 16, then 18, then 24. And I'm good with tw 24 is pretty wide for me. 24 works. Okay. And then it goes to 35, which now you're starting to get into normalcy. 35 is almost um, a normal viewing angle. It's a little bit wider than normal peripheral vision. It's a little bit wider, but it still looks realistic. Okay? And a 35 is a lot of times thrown into the category of photojournalist era lenses. Like it's a reality capturer. It doesn't go too wide. It doesn't go too zoomed in. It kind of shows reality the way it looks. Uh, so 35 is kind of a standard, an industry standard. I don't have a 35. I have it in here though. I have 35 if I want it in here. Okay. So the next lens on this list is the 50. And to me, the 50 is the monarch of all the lenses. Um, the 50 is, I would say any photographer that's relatively interested in photography and investing in equipment is going to have a 50 millimeter lens in their bag. Okay. I tell students all the time when they're ready to upgrade and get rid of their digital rebel and get a full frame camera or something nicer. And they're like, they ask, well, what lens should I get? And I say, the first lens you should buy is the 50 and the 50, which I have right here on this camera it's generally a smaller lens. I've got this little thing on it just because I, I love my, this is my favorite lens, the 50. Um, as you can probably tell by the way I talk about it. But the 50 
is small generally on most cameras it's kind of compact it's easy to carry around i mean look at the difference you know i mean it's just it and it's let me just before i go on too much praising the 50 what it is the 50 is basically this right if i'm looking at my subject and i'm i'm looking at whatever i'm about to photograph and then i put the 50 up to my eye it looks the same it basically reproduces reality almost exactly the way a human peripheral vision would see things the 50 sees it the way human beings see it and that's why i like it it's boom it's reality boom so the other thing i'm going to talk about now is why i like the 50 is because they're cheaper so even if you're a you know a new photographer and the first good lens you're going to buy is the 50 the 50 is only going to set you back only about 300 350 bucks okay and that's cheap trust me for a lens the other good thing is if you spend that kind of money you're going to get a good aperture you're going to get you're going to get an f2 if you see that two i have a two and then it goes to two eight it goes to four but i have an f2 two is a good aperture it's a big aperture it lets in a lot of light okay and i'm going to show the chart again on that but um, some 50s will go to 1.4, 1.8, which is even better. I'm good with two. Um, two is enough for me. But um, the 50 is, to me, the first lens you should buy if you're just starting out. And some people would say, well, that's not very, like, I like this because I can. I got 50 in this. Like, this is a 24 to 70. Remember that. So this is a 24 to 70. Why would I buy a 50 if I've got... 24 to 70 means when I, if I zoom this at a certain level right there, I just, I picked it. I can get 50 in this lens. Why would I need a 50? Well, that's the next thing I want to explain. And some of you probably know this. This is a 50 prime, which means it only does 50. This does 24 to 70. So 50 is in there, but 50 looks better on a 50 prime than 50 looks on a 50 zoom. And I'm going to, without getting into mechanics, I'm just going to say, this is a great lens, a very expensive lens, a very versatile lens, but it's not as good as a 50 2.0 at 50. It's a little bit more vignetting. It's not got the image quality to 50 is. And why is that? Well, it's mainly because this lens being a prime was built to be a 50. It was built for 50. It's all it does, and it does it exceptionally well. Whereas this is versatile, but it's more like a jack of all trades. It does it, does it all pretty well, but not nearly as good as a prime. Okay? So it's just something to keep in mind. What's the drawback to a prime? Well, very simple. I have two bodies here. Um, I could have a third or a fourth body. If I had just all primes, like a 50 on one, a 35 on another, an 85 on another, and a 200 on another all prime, I'd have to, I'd either have to be changing my lenses all the time in any different situation, or, you know, that's, that's the problem with a prime is once you don't, once it's, there's a scene that might be a problem with the 50 and what would be a problem with a 50? I'll, I'll I'll just share that as well as I can in this room. The problem with a 50 or something that's a prime is if you get into a tight room or something or where you don't have a lot of room, because remember, you have to back up or get closer. A lot of times with the 50, you have to back up. So if you are in a room like this size, I know it's a cluttered room, but let's say I got six people against this wall over here and I need to take their photo. And they're like, yeah, just do it. Get, get a quick shot. And I'm kind of, you know, I'm running around doing photos. They say, yeah, get a shot of us. I'd be in trouble if I just had a 50 on. And the reason being is because I would have to back up to try to get everybody that's on that wall in the frame. And I wouldn't have enough room to back up. And that's where a wide angle comes into play, where then if I just go to 24, boom, I can get them all. So that's why this lens is so nice. And if I'm doing a wedding, generally, um, especially if there's if, if if it's only me by myself, 
I'm just going to keep this 24 to 70 on pretty much all day. Okay. Because it has so much more versatility, but if I have a chance, I'm going to use my 50. Okay. So hopefully that makes some sense. I know I'm sure it does, but there's drawbacks to primes and there's positives to primes. Okay. So now I'm at 50. So from 50, where do we go? And we're going zoomier and or tell more telephotos we go from 50. Um, the next to me, photo photographers must have at some point, it was the one of the last ones I got is the 85. Okay. The 85 is the gold standard for portraiture. Okay. And the 85 I have again in prime. It's a prime 85. Okay. Now this lens, unfortunately, is not as cheap as the 50. This is about a thousand dollars for 85. Okay. And that's actually kind of relatively affordable. It's a Fujifilm lens. Uh, Nikon might even be a little more than that, but regardless, it's an 85. So let's talk about that. If 50 is like this normal human peripheral vision, 85 is cropped in, zoomed in even more. Why would that be better for portraiture? We're going to talk about that, but I'm going to use this word a few times today. Compression is one reason. The 85 zooms in a little bit more, closer to your subject, gets your subject closer to the camera. And what that does is make that depth of field, that bokeh, okay? And I'm going to talk about bokeh too. It makes that softness in the background really stand out. And uh, it separates your subject from your background. So what an 85 does, and also what this 85 has, and most 85s do, any good 85, it's got a 1.2 aperture on it. So that's a, a 1.2. So it goes to 1.2, and it goes all the way. There's 2.8, almost in the middle, 2.8. And then you go to... 16 or whatever i don't think i've ever i don't think i've ever shot this lens on f16 most of the time i'm about right there at two maybe 1.4 i rarely go to 1.2 uh but there i'm there because i want that soft background when i'm using this lens okay so the 85 zoomed in i used a word called compression and i'm going to talk about that but the closer you get to your subject and your focal point the faster depth of field falls off it's just the nature of optics okay and, and i'll explain that a little bit but 85 is a very important lens in photography the next lens and the only other lens i have is the 70 to 200 okay and yes, there's like the 75 to 300. This one, in all my lenses, um, they have f2.8 all the way through, okay? And I'm going to talk about that here as we go forward. But the 70 to 200, Nikon has one, Canon has one, Sony has one, Fuji has one. 70 to 200 is a, an iconic lens. It's good for sports. Okay, it's not the best for sports. A 600 is really good for sports, especially football. But for like for what I do, hockey and basketball or whatever, this is perfect. Okay, so a 70 to 200, what does that mean? Well, I've got a 24 to 70. So these two lenses are almost beautiful together, really, because this is 24 to 70. And then this is 70 to 200. So this, as soon as this finishes, this gets as zoomy as it possibly can, then this takes over and goes all the way to 200. And it's 2.8 all the way through. The problem, not really a problem, but photography is expensive, right? To get a good 2470 that's 2.8 aperture all the way through, or to get a 70 to 200 that's 2.8 aperture all the way through, you're going to have to spend some money. I mean, we're talking $1,600 for this and probably, you know, 2000 for this. It's not it's not cheap. That's just the way photography is. And I don't expect Photo One students to have this stuff. It's just... You know, um, but that's what that's what I have in my bag. And it's kind of just not me. It's that's kind of a standard photography professional setup. Uh, uh, a 50, a 24 to 70, a 50, an 85 and a 70 to 200. If you have those four lenses, you can 
you can make money at photography if you know what you're doing and do about any job anybody would ask, really. Uh, now, does that mean you could do wildlife photography in Africa, like, you know, gazelles a half a mile away? No, then you'd want a 600 meter, millimeter lens. And then you're talking eight to $10,000 for one of those. Um, I don't have one because I, I don't do that. But, you know, there's specialized or a macro lens if you do, uh, you know, insect photography or something. A macro just means it focuses really close up. It magnifies your subject. I don't have one of those. I want one, though. I'd like to get one. Um, but uh, does anybody have any questions about just that, what I've just talked about, like the differences in focal length? That's all I've talked about so far is just focal length, how wide or how telephoto it is that's written on the lenses or it's you know engraved on the lenses um you'll see it you know right at the bottom there it says it but you'll see it on any lens so if you see those numbers 16 to 55 or 24 to 70 or 18 to 55 or whatever it may be that's just what that is i'm sure most of you know that okay so the next thing is what would be your let me see what ann says here what would be your recommendation for night photography, stars and sky? Good question. Um, well, if you have even the cheap version, there's a cheap version of the 70 to 200 called the 75 to 300 that Canon and, uh, and Nikon makes. You know, um, if it was, if I, if money wasn't an issue, I would say the 600 millimeter National Geographic giant lens because you're going to get close. You'd be surprised. It makes a big difference. It's like a telescope. You get a lot closer to the moon or whatever with a zoom lens. Um, so at the very least, say let's live in reality land. And I don't expect Anne's going to go out and spend $8,000 on the 600 millimeter lens. I would say a 70 to 200. Okay. Definitely. Um, but if not, if you don't have enough to get the, this is 2.8 all the way through. Those 75 to 300 millimeter lenses that you can find online, they don't have as good of an aperture. They usually start at F4 to 5.6, not as good of an aperture, but those are really good for night photography, stars and sky. So anything that's a long lens, when I say long lens, I just mean something like this, a telephoto is going to be better for night photography. Um, but you know, that uh, there's always a but, but that's what I would suggest. But in the same respect, you could use a wide angle lens for night skies too. Like if you were doing like the Aurora Borealis or something and you really wanted to get the whole sky, you could use like a 35 or a 50. The real key to night photography, not to go off on it too much, is very long exposures. A tripod is probably your best friend for night photography and also no light pollution. So go out somewhere in a cornfield or somewhere where there's no light pollution and you just have the sky. And if you do like a 10 minute exposure, you'd be pretty surprised at some of the stuff you start to see come up like nebulas and stuff like that. It's pretty interesting. But generally, a zoomier lens is going to show you stuff more farther out into space. Does that does that help? Hopefully that helps a little bit. But so a longer lens is generally what most people would use. But more it's about the shutter speed and your exposure and light pollution. Um, and I'm going to just say one more thing about night photography. I've been frustrated before because I'm a pretty good photographer. I've been doing it a while. And I'll sometimes get on Facebook and when there's like an eclipse or something, and, and some friend of mine takes this amazing photo on their iPhone. And I'm like, man, that looks better than something I've done on my camera. And the reason is, is they, they just, they, kind of maybe accidentally got it right or they zoomed in in the right place. And it, it's, it, you know, there's a lot of factors there, but you, you're you always going to get a better, if you really put your mind to it, you're going to get a better image with good optics. But um, a lot of it's just the exposure itself. If you get a good exposure or not, like you get a good solid amount of light onto your sensor. So um, it, it can be, it can be tough, but long exposures are definitely better. So but that's your basic set of lenses that I think in the professional realm, anybody would say that's a good, good, good group of lenses to have. So why am I saying all this? Not that you're going to go out tomorrow and buy all these lenses. I just wanted to give you an idea of why they exist and what they do and different purposes. Um, so that's the one part of lenses is how the viewing angle, the, the focal length is what it's called. 
The second part of lenses is even more important, sort of, I mean, they're both important, is the aperture. Now, with cheaper lenses and no bougie judgment on cheaper lenses, I, I, you know, they're fine. A good photographer will do, will make amazing photographs with even a cheap lens. And I have seen this over and over again in photo one. Uh, students come in and they take really great photos with Canon Digital Rebel with a 18 to 55. It, it's because they have a good eye and they know what they're doing. They're looking and they get a good eye for light. So it doesn't mean you can't be a good photographer if you don't have this stuff. Um, but it does help because the main thing is on the cheaper lenses, you do not get that big aperture. Okay. You do not get, you do not get F 2.8. You don't, you get like, and I have three, five written in there. You get three, five on an 18 to 55 on one of your kit lenses, but only when your lens is at its widest angle which is really counterintuitive. And I'm gonna explain why it's called compression again, compression. Because if you get a really big aperture, three, five is pretty big, okay? If you get that three, five, but your lens is as wide as it can possibly be, it's sort of defeating the purpose of depth of field in the first place, because the wider you are, the farther you are away from your subject, the slower things fall out of focus. So it's kind of counterproductive. <laughs> and that's a hard concept for people to understand at first. But the zoomier, the closer up you are to your subject, the faster depth of field falls off. And that's a huge, huge, huge thing in photography to understand. Um, and this is the way I explain it in a, in a kindergarten way, but I think it's somewhat effective, is that if I am looking into the distance, right now I'm just looking at the wall in front of me and I can focus on everything there. I can see it just fine. But as soon as I put my finger up in front of my face and I focus on my fingertip, everything behind it is blurry, right? That's just the nature of optics. If you're focusing on something that's close up to you, everything behind it gets blurry. And, and just as you would think, and it's harder sometimes to see with your eyes, but if you take the finger farther away and just look at your finger from farther away, it's easier to th see the things behind it, okay? It's it's really, in a way, simple and almost weird, to, but that's the way I've explained it. But if you have something really close up and you almost have to cross your eyes to focus on it, everything behind it falls out of focus. So the rule is there's three things, and I want you to write this down. There are three things, exactly three things that affect depth of field in an image. And when I say depth of field, what I mean is how blurry or how sharp the background is and the foreground before the focal point, okay? But there's three things that affect it. So write this down. Um, the first is aperture, very important. I mean, if you have a big aperture, stuff blurs very quickly. If you have a small aperture, everything stays in focus for miles. OK, that's the first thing. Aperture, number one. Number two is your distance to subject. That affects your depth of field. Distance to subject. OK, number three. I don't know why those balloons are going. That was funny. Number three is focal length of lens, which I've just talked about. So those are the three things. One is aperture affects depth of field. One. Two is distance to subject affects depth of field. And three is focal length of lens affects depth of field. Now here's the, here's the kick. Two and three are exactly the same thing. Distance to subject and focal length of lens are exactly the same thing, just done in different ways, okay? What I mean by that is if I put this lens on and I'm in a room with you and you're like 10 feet away from me and I put this lens on my camera, you're literally in my face, like I'm photographing your nostrils. So this is distance to subject. It's just done optically, right? So zoomier lenses, telephoto lenses tend to give you that depth of field faster and better than a wide angle. A wide angle lens is not made for shallow depth of field. 
A wide angle lens is far away from the subject. It's meant to capture a big, huge area, but you're not going to get really good depth of field fall off in a wide angle lens. Okay. So aperture, obviously the, well, not obviously, but the bigger the aperture is the faster depth of field falls off. Second thing is distance of subject. So what does that mean? Distance of subject. That's not this. This is focal length of length. Distance to subject would be like if I have my 50 and I did the same thing. If I was in a room with you and I put the camera right up here to your eye, right? And then there's a little bit of background behind it. Everything in the background is going to be really blurry, but your eye or my eye would be really in focus in this photo. So that's distance to subject just by moving. And that's what I love about the 50 and why I shoot with the 50 all the time because it engages you in this it engages you in the photography when i'm going around shooting with my 50 i'm kind of nerdy but like i love to move around and like i mean that's to me that's the fun of photography move get closer look around you know with a with a zoom lens what i see a lot of people doing including professionals or people that are like um interning or whatever they'll like get in a corner of a room and be kind of meek and like Hey, whatever, it, whatever style you like is fine though, but they'll just kind of, they're not engaged as much. They're kind of like, it's almost like they're doing spy photography and they're just kind of going one place and going like this and not really getting actively involved where it was a 50, you kind of have to, you got to move around and get into it. So, you know, that's kind of personal taste anyway for me, but this I think inspires a lot more creativity um, than something that's just a Zoom Okay, uh, so let me uh, stop there and think of what I want to go to next. Let's talk about bokeh, okay? Bokeh, depth of field, why care, right? Why? If, and, and again, I know a lot of you look at photography and are interested, so you already know. Um, but why is everybody so caught up in bokeh? Because it's beautiful, that's why. It's just, it looks great and it separates the subject from the background. Okay. That's what it does. And I want to tell you what, what the B O K E H. Okay. B O K E H. It's a Japanese term. Um, probably a thousand years ago, maybe a little less than a thousand years ago, but way before photography. And what it is, is Japanese sumi yi. They use their calligraphy and their brushes. Um, and, you know, watercolor inks, right? And I would say they invented it. I think the Chinese, I mean, a lot of people were doing one, just the Japanese, but the Japanese coined the term. But what they would do is they would do these paintings, right? And they would have, in the foregrounds would be these trees close up and the river would be close up and the lines would be very solid and black and thick and solid. This is just a design thing. And then the farther back into the painting, the mountains that were way back there, they would start to, they, they'd make smaller lines and wispier lines and broken lines and lack of line at all and make everything kind of break apart. And what did it do? It made things look farther away. If you did everything in really solid lines, everything would look very two-dimensional. So what the Japanese, and I'm, again, I don't think they invented it, but it's just a painter kind of thing is they would soften everything linearly as things got farther away. And that shows depth of field. It shows things farther away. So that's what that's what bokeh does in a sense. It's not exactly the same because it's not like it's a they did things in a blur, but it's the same idea that background is not as important as the foreground or subject is more important than all the crap going on in the background. And with that, I want to show you all like this, where I used to, well, I haven't worked in about a year, but I still do if he needs me. But where I worked, what I did for, you know, 20, 25 years, I don't know, it's been a, while, a long time, is um, this studio that I worked for here. And um, we'll just uh, have a look at Boca and what it is in a portrait kind of setting, but it's not just for portraits. Um, it can be done for um, anything. So he, like he, we did a lot of commercial stuff too, not just, uh, not just weddings and, you know, but let's just go, I'm just going to go to senior photos. Okay. And I know it's, you know, it's actually a good way to make money. Um, senior photos is one of the better ones. Um, but 
what I'm just going to pick, I'm going to pick one that I know, like most of these are his, but I, I did a couple in here when I was with him. Um, This one here. So here's what Boca. Now this is Boca and I'm kind of far away from the subject, right? Um, I'm not, I'm not that close. I'm maybe 20 feet away, but I had kind of a, I had, I think I had an 85 on for this. But what it does, and you know, the light, the light in here is obviously really nice too. But what bokeh does is just sort of separate the subject from the background. And in here, it's not so blurry that you can't see what's going on. And sometimes, and I did this when I first started, I would get so hooked on bokeh that I wanted it to be so blurry that you didn't see anything. But sometimes it's nice to be able to still have some focus on what's in the background, but just not as sharp as the foreground, right? So it really depends, but there's one in here that I wanted to point out that, um, is it on this one? Was it here? There's one where there was a car or something in the background. I can't remember where that was. Um, but there are times basically when you don't want the background to stand out, right? You don't want like the, I don't, this pose, I didn't take this. So I'm kind of surprised. This isn't the like, to me, this isn't the greatest pose. It's okay. But what I do can say about Boca in this one, even though it's, it's kind of strange because I'm like, I'm wondering what he's looking at here, but we don't need to see the cars and everything. If everything in this was in focus, it would really detract, which I think him looking away kind of detracts from it too, but it would detract from your subject. So something like this, a lot of times Boca is very good at um, getting rid of excess noise in the background. Okay. And, and, and other than that, oh, it's this one. This is the one, right? So this is a very good example of it. So here, if you look, there's some, that might even be a person back there. I don't even know. That might've been a person. I didn't take this one. Um, Monty took most of these. This is his company. Um, and there's, you know, it looks like there could be like, uh, you know, maybe a car park back there. I don't know. But all this stuff back here is not what's important in this image. What's important in this image is the way the light's hitting her hair, her face, her smile, you know, and... Oops, that's my, yeah, my mount, Magic Mouse does that. Sorry, come on. Uh, let me go back to this. Yeah, so what's important here is the subject. And that's exactly what Boca does, right? It separates the subject from the background. That's why it's important, right? Um, so hope, I'm sure that makes sense. And, and, and not to say it always has to be super blurry, right? It doesn't. It doesn't have to always be super blurry. Oops. Again, I, I should turn that feature off of my ma magic mouse, but like here, it's not that blurry, right? So it doesn't always have to be super soft. And the other one I want to say on this to, to emphasize that it doesn't always have to be super soft after we look at this one is here. It's not that. And, and, and in a way, I don't want to get really into masculine feminine here or anything, but there is, you know, sometimes depending on the image and the photographer, there is a little difference. You will see a lot of times with, young men and and those those standards can change but um but with young men a lot of times you will see a little bit less of it like more rigidity and whatever but you know that's kind of personal taste of the photographer but you know you can still have males and photos with soft background it all it really always looks great with trees right especially in the fall it's a nice thing so how do you get that aperture for the most part aperture a big aperture in your lens and also distance to subject and the one other one i wanted to show you really quickly and we'll get back to in face is the one i have on facebook or not facebook Flickr, of one that i have in my environmental a lot of these environmental lighting shots are stuff i've done like just kind of on my own but um the problem with bokeh in some way, it's not really, but the thing that can happen if you're not careful with bokeh, and I really didn't put this up there as that, but here's a photo I took of my dog, okay? Now, obviously, that's a pug, and they have very short faces, right? But with bokeh, when you're at, does this say, yeah, I'm at f1.4, which is a giant aperture, okay? 1.4, very huge aperture. 
it's so the depth of field falls off so fast that I focused on the end of my dog's nose and it's a flat faced dog, right? That by the time it gets back to his eyes, it's already getting soft. So in some ways you have to be careful not to overdo the bokeh. And I, I think this still looks fine, but sometimes I would catch myself overdoing the bokeh where I would have rather it been his little nose was in focus and his little eyes. And then maybe it fell off a little bit, but I'm being super nitpicky. But the point being is sometimes, sometimes bokeh can get too much like you and, and, and a really, and here's one example I'll give you of that. Let's say you're taking a picture of three people together in a line, right? And if they're not in a perfect line, boom, boom, boom. If one of them is a little bit forward and one of them's a little bit behind and you don't even notice it and you have like an F 1.2, you're only going to get focus on one of those people. So I would always say when you're focusing like on a group of people or taking a picture of a group of people, even if they're in a line, you should go to at least five, six, because um, you don't want you don't want one person that's a little bit at forward to be in focus and everybody else to be soft behind them in a group photo. So there's reasons not to have the Boca and you'll know, you'll know when you get a lens that has it, that you'll, you'll love it and want to do it all the time, but sometimes you got to be careful with it. Um, hopefully that makes some sense, but not to get too far into that realm. Um, but let's, uh, let's talk about, um, let me think here. Does anybody have any questions or comments about any of this stuff I've talked about so far? Okay, good. Um, if you do, that's good. I mean, just chat if you want. Um, okay, so um, I'm just looking at my notes here. Um, aperture as open as you can get it. Yeah, prime. I talked about prime lenses. Um, light. I'm going to talk depth of field assignment. Yeah, three things that affect depth of field. We got that. Okay. So in the in-person class, I did it. I did it. I did did it. Okay. I did the assignment. This will literally, if you know what you're doing, this depth of field assignment will take you 20 minutes. Okay. And, and not to say you'd rush it. Um, what I'm looking for in this depth of field assignment is not creativity this time. Okay. You can be. I like, I'm not saying don't be but I'm looking for technical prowess here, okay? I'm looking for matching two exposures with two different depths of field. Now that sounds easy, right? Okay, so let me lay this out. The assignment is four photos, two sets of two of the same photo, okay? Two of the same photo and then two of a different photo, but the same photo and two again. So two shots of two photo. As a matter of fact, I'm just gonna show it to you now on Flickr so that you know what exactly what I'm talking about, how it's uploaded by a student, all right? So let's go here and I'm gonna go to um, Mahir because I, I, I did Amy last time, hers, and she had six, which you don't have to have six, you only have to have four. So this is what it should look like. Let's see, hopefully he didn't take, he didn't take it down, good, okay. So, and he kind of was off a little bit, honestly, but, it's this, okay? So depth of field, he was pretty close, but this is darker. You can see, if you look from this one to this one, left to right, this is darker than this one. The exposures are not the same here. The second one, the exposures are the same. So that that's good. This one looks a little bit brighter, but I'm not gonna dive into numbers right now. I just want you to know, if you look at this, okay, this one is F8, which, and actually kind of shallow depth of field here too. But this one is F29. So he really went overboard. Probably not the best example. He, he really went crazy. He went from F8 to F29, and that's where he got into trouble. I'm going to lay this out for you so you do it exactly the correct way. As a matter of fact, I'm, I, I, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and take back what I said. We're going to go to Amy Grantine because I know just off, my, off the top of my head she did it exactly right. So Amy... Um, let's find hers depth of field, depth of field, right here. Okay. And, and the only thing she did wrong, not really, is she did, she went over and above and did six instead of four. I'm going to skip this one. And the reason I'm going to skip this one is because it's so flat, meaning she didn't have a lot of 
depth in the there's not a lot behind everything it's all kind of flat like um comparably to this one where stuff goes back into the distance and that's kind of what you want so the first thing is you want to get really up close to your subject okay compression you're going to get depth of field that way now amy happens to have a lens that is f2 a lot of you all don't have that I'm going to show you the numbers here in a second, though, to make it so you can do it the correct way. She went from F2 at a 250th. ISO stays the same. Don't touch your F, don't touch your touch your ISO. She went from F2 at a 250th to F56 at a 30th. Okay. Three stop change is what I'm looking for. Okay. And I'm going to show you that here in a second. She went from F2 to f5.6 so there's f2 look how soft everything gets she's focused on this piano key right here to f5.6 and do you notice nothing moves like look at the image nothing moves in it because she has her camera on a tripod i would highly suggest using a tripod so boom f2 f5.6 okay so Seems easy, right? Like, well, I mean, you just change from F2 to F5.6. And I know you don't have two to five, two, a lot of you. So let's talk this way. Let's talk this way. Let me get this camera out of the way. I'm going to assume if you do have 2.8 on your camera, use it if you want, okay? If you do have a lens that has 2.8, you use it. You can use it. But we're going to assume that all of you all only have 5.6. Don't do 3.5. Don't do these middle... 3.5 is a middle aperture. It's some third of a stop. Stick with the standards, okay? 2.8, 4, 5.6, 8, 11, 16. I'm going to just lay this out for you as easy as I can because it's okay. It's a learning process regardless, okay? First of all, don't do this indoors. You're going to hurt yourself indoors, meaning you're not going to have enough light. Because if you have to start at five, six, and you have to jump three stops, your five, six is going to be your shallow depth of field shot. Okay. And then you're going to go boom, boom, boom to F16. That's what I want you to do. Take the first shot at five, six, take the second shot at F16. Now, if you're indoors, if you're indoors and you're going to shoot at F16, that F16 is going to be, well, let me just ask. What happens when we go from 5, 6 to 16? You're letting in a lot less light. So if you're indoors, look how dark it is in my hallway right now. If you were try trying to shoot F16 in there, or even in this room right now, you wouldn't get it. You would It would be too dark. So do this outside on a sunny day, okay? And and that's, that's the best time to do this. Um, start at F5, 6. And let's say... You shoot at five, six, and your, your light meter tells you a thousand. That's probably what it will tell you a thousand or two thousand or maybe 500, but it will tell you somewhere like a thousand or a 500. You do your first shot at F five, six at a thousand. When you go to 16, one, two, three to 16, what happens? It gets one, two, three stops darker. What do you got to do to compensate for that? Here's the real trick in this whole assignment. You have to go one, two, three stops brighter on your shutter speed, longer. So if your first shot is F5, 6 at a thousandth, your second shot is F16 at a 125th. And they're going to be exactly the same exposure. One with shallow depth of field and one with deep depth of field. And that's all it is. But the exercise in the learning process is you have to balance these. When we talk about the exposure triangle, it's aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. But let's be real here. The only two that really should be changed all the time and the ones that any professional photographer is out when they're shooting is changing on a regular basis are these two, aperture and shutter speed. They're not messing with ISO. They are, I mean, that's the problem with trying to set rules. They are, if you go from inside to outside, yeah. Then you change your ISO from like 400 to 100, yeah. Or if you go from out in the field to under a picnic 
uh, shelter, yeah, you're going to change your ISO, but you are not ever changing the ISO as a means of exposure control. It's and, and again, not to sound bougie, but that's a very amateur way to change your exposure. In some ways, is it easy? Yeah. You, you know, the easiest way to change your exposure really is not even change aperture or shutter speed at all. Just go, oh, that's too dark. Oh, I'll just bump my ISO up to 3200. Oh, it looks good now. It's bright. It looks good. But what's the problem with that? Now it looks terrible, though, because it's got noise and grain. You want to keep your ISO as low as you possibly can for whatever lighting conditions you have and then leave it there. Don't mess with it because the higher it goes, the worse it looks. So that's why we do this. And also we do this because this aperture changes the way your photo looks depth of field wise. It changes the whole kind of notion of the image. If it's a landscape, you want everything in focus. And if it's a portrait, you want everything soft. Okay. So, um, I am kind of jumping around, but hopefully the assignment is this simple. Like if I lay it out right now, first things first, go outside, bright light. Second thing, like I said, I don't care if it's creative. You saw Amy's, it was just a piano thing, you know, find something and put it close up to your camera. Not so close that your camera can't focus on it though. Okay. Cause your camera has a focal length, like a focusing distance where it stops and it can't so don't get it that close. Get it close up. Put something as your subject, then put close, put something in the middle ground, and then leave it and then have background. Then put your camera on a tripod, set it to five, six, take your first shallow depth of field shot, change it to 16 after you get this shot, and shoot that one. And here's, it, it It sounds easy, but the problem is, let's say this, let's say you get out there and you've got five, six, and here's why I can't stand digital rebels. And, and I, I tell you all to get them because they're cheaper, but one of the problems with them is that if you're, if you're out in the sun, you know, what's going to happen. And you, you set this up, your light meter is not going to tell you a thousandth. You know what it's going to tell you? Eight sixtieth or like six fortieth. Stay away from that. It stuff's evil. I'm kidding, but it's it's not good. It's thirds of stops. There's no need for them. Honestly, cameras never had them until 15 years ago, really. Um, some of them did on apertures. But my point is, why? Why is that a pain? Well, because of this. If you if I shoot one at five, six at a thousandth a shot, I don't even have to look at my light meter for my F16 shot because this is the rule. F56 at a thousandth always, always equals F16 at a 125th. One, two, three, one, two, three, it's going to be the same exposure every time. And you do that anywhere on this, it's that way. F4 at a 60th equals F56 at a 30th. F4 at a 60th equals F56 at a 30th. F8 at a 250th equals F11 at a 125th. That's just numerical fact. So the point is, is this. If you get and you set up your depth of field assignment and you're at F56 and your camera tells you 860, ignore it. Don't take it. Just go ahead and set it to a thousandth. Who cares if it's a little bit darker? It's not even going to be that much darker just going one little click to a thousandth, okay? Hopefully that makes sense. So if your light meter goes, yeah, you should be at F5, 6, at an 8, 72. Go, no, I'll, I'll just go to a thousandth, thank you. And I'll be fine. Because why? Because now you don't even have to look at it again. You you know, you, all you got to do is now, okay, now I'm changing it to 16 and I'm going to go 125th and I guarantee it's right, okay? So that's the problem with these weird intermittent thirds of stops. You can't bow, you can't say, and you can't compare as well, okay? So hopefully that made sense because I see a lot of students get caught up in that where they're like, oh, well, I started it, even in apertures, I was at F7.1. Okay, I've been shooting for 30 years or more. 
I couldn't tell you what one stop smaller than 7.1 was. I have no idea what that is. Okay. I don't, because I don't shoot with 7.1. Now, if you said, Hey, Greg, what's one stop smaller than 5.6? I'll tell you F8 all day. I know that. If you tell me what's one stop smaller than F8, F11, I know that. But if you tell me, if you say like 8.7 or whatever it is in here, I don't know what that is, the one stop smaller is between F11 and 16. I don't know. So that's why I don't get involved in all that. Stay away from those middle ones. Okay. So um, let me think here. I don't want to miss anything. I'm, I'm thinking of pitfalls, right? There's another pitfall. Some students, and I don't think I'm going to have this in this class, but some students, do you know, they, 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 they go through this whole lecture and this is okay, but you go through this whole lecture and I try my best to explain this as well as I possibly can. Um, and they think it's a focus assignment, meaning they think, oh, the first photo, I'm at F5, 6 of the thousandth and I focus on the thing in the foreground. The second photo, I just keep it at five, six of the thousandth and focus on something in the background. So they just change what they focus on. No, no, that's easy. I mean, you know, it's relatively easy. You know, all they're doing is focusing on two different things in a scene. Um, it's about depth of field changing and keeping the exposure the same in both photos, right? So um, you can't just focus on two different things. And in these photos, in these four photos, two groups of two, you want to focus on the same thing in both photos. Don't change what you're focused on, right? That's another pitfall. Um, but mainly the biggest pitfall that I see are these in-between stops people get themselves caught up in, like Mahir did even. And Mahir knows what he's doing. Pretty good photographer, but he even did it. He got went to F29, which is crazy. Oh, and just to emphasize this, three stops is all I'm asking. F29 is, there's 22, and then there's like 29 is way up here. So he went from like five, six, he went one, two, three, four, five stops. Way too much. All I'm asking you to do is go one, two, three. So if you have F28 on your camera, if you do, that's cool. If you have an F28 lens, just go one, two, three to eight. Just go 2.8 to eight. Okay, and that's fine. 2.8 is going to show bokeh a lot more than 5.6 will. So it'll actually, it, lo it looks nicer when you have these bigger apertures. I just assume most of you don't. Okay, but the whole point is one, two, three. One, two, three. Right? So screen cap that. Make sure you have that. Like photograph it with your phone or screen cap this. You, you really should know these. Um, I know some of you are photo majors, and if you're photo majors, you probably do. Or, and if you don't, you will. I mean, you will eventually, um, and you should. Should's a guilt word. I'm not saying if you don't, don't feel bad, but um, you will know these because this is the standard. This is the industry standard. Okay, so it just makes everything easier. Um, all right, so I don't want to keep blathering on. There's a video, and I'm not going to show it because it's on eLearn, but this I really, really highly, highly recommend you watch the first half of it. Don't even watch the whole thing because the, the second part's – you can you can watch the whole thing if you want. But I want to show you where it's at really quickly here. We're going to go here, and we're just going to go to bookmarks. And I know I'm like you, you all can find this yourselves. I get it. We're all adults, but I'm just going to show you anyway here. So if we go into – digital photo one and you go into um uh content right and then you go into um depth of field right because that's what we're doing depth of field remember four images right and this uh, both of these are good right this one um this is just a diagram of the apertures i don't know if you'll see it it'll yeah so that just shows you the apertures but it only goes to eight right? you know and <laughs> there's a lot more after eight but uh, the aperture and depth of field made easy. And th this guy really explained something about, I don't know, 10 minutes in that I think helps a lot. And that is this. And I don't, one thing that confuses the hell out of photo students is why does this number get bigger and the hole gets smaller? That is so counterintuitive. And I get it, it is. But he says, Look at everything like F, 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 
all the way out, just a bunch of Fs. The more Fs that are go out, the longer things are in focus. So the bigger the number, the bigger the number, the more distance focus you have, right? So the bigger the number, the more in focus you have in the foreground and in the background. The smaller the number, the smaller the depth of field or the shorter the depth of field. So a smaller number means smaller or shorter depth of field. That's a better way sometimes to think about it, right? And the smaller the number, the more depth of field, more depth of field, it lets in more light, right? That's that's the reason this this is not only just good for bokeh like that's that's a really good thing but it's also good if you're like say in a dark you go to Dublin pub or something and there's a band that your friend is in and you're taking photos you're not going to be doing that at f16 trust me you're probably going to struggle at 56 to get good light unless you have a really powerful good flash then you'll be fine but if you're at 2.8, you're going to get a lot of environmental light. You're going to get a lot of nice light that's just kind of bleeding in. That's environmental. And, and so even in low light situations, a big aperture is really handy for environmental and ambient light. It's just nice. Uh, the reason people, and I don't do this again to sound like, oh, Mr. Moneybags, because I'm not. But the reason people will spend... $1,900 on this, which is, I don't know if it's that much now, but these are close to $2,000 for, because it has 2.8 all the way through. There's no, it's not four, it's not five, six, it has that, but it has 2.8 all the way through. The reason people like me pay that much for these is because we need that 2.8. We want that light. And, and I've said this before, but in photography, you rarely run into the problem of too much light. Almost never, but you might with that creative motion. I bet you some of you have. Like you go outside and it's too bright because your shutter speed is so long. And even though you've made your aperture as small as it can, you have too much light. You can run into the problem of too much light, but rarely. You know what problem 99% of the time you run into a, as a photographer? Not enough light. Almost always not enough light. You can you always have that problem. There's never enough light, really. So big aperture helps. Like that's, that's huge. Like to have a, when I have this 85 or my 50 on and I walk inside somewhere, I can shoot without a flash all day and take great photos in ambient light because I've got an F2 on my, on my lens. It's wonderful to have. So um, let me think here. I think we're good. I, I just don't, I don't want to send you away without making sure I've missed, I just want to make sure I haven't missed anything. Want to emphasize again, do not change your ISO between photos. Let's look at a few student examples and then we'll be done. Okay. We're going to share screen, go back to Flickr. And, and I'm not going to pick these apart. Like I'm not going to look at every one of them. But again, the resource is there for you to, to look at uh, all these examples. But basically, I want to look at a couple and how they, the first one is kind of wrong. And I'm going to show you why. And also kind of right at the same time. So if you look at this first one right here, just without looking at the numbers, it looks like he nailed it perfectly. Because again, what am I looking for as an instructor? The exposures have to be exactly the same. They have to look exactly the same. And you could say, yeah, this actually, this yellow looks a little bit brighter here than this, but I'm really splitting hairs. These exposures are pretty equal. He did a good job, but his first mistake, he's in a basement. And I promise you, it's not that bright in that basement. So what did he do? He's in a basement. He's doing a shallow depth of field one first. And he's at F4, 5, which is a weird aperture. Messed up there too. Should have been 4 or 5, 6, but not 4.5. Because I don't know what that translates to. Okay, so 4 or 5, 6, he would have been better. Secondly, he's got a really high ISO, which is fine. He's in a basement. But he shouldn't have been in a basement in the first place to do this. And he's got, but look, he's got a 1 60th of a second shutter speed. So I know on the next one that he, he's going to go to a really small aperture to get depth of field. And he's already at a 60th. So that means he's going to be at like a fifth or something like that for his next one. He's going to be a 30th, a 15th, an eighth, a fourth. He would have to go to a fourth to go three stops more exposure, a fourth of a second which is fine if you have a tripod, but it's just really making it difficult to do this, okay? So what he does is he goes to 
and it looks good, but he goes to F29. I don't know what it is with F20. I think it's like that was the big, the smallest aperture on the camera. It's probably why Mahir did it too. They just went all the way to the smallest aperture. What he should have done is just go from four to five, six to eight to 11. He should have just gone to 11. And he said he went to 29. So not only did he have to go to a fifth of a second, which is basically a fourth of a second, again, bad, bad aperture or bad shutter speed number. And then he had to, he had to double his ISO, right? He had to, to get the light. He had to, so it's wrong in every way, but he got, he got a lot of credit for this. And I'm going to explain my grading philosophy on this in a second. This one, if I saw this like this and they're matching, the other thing about this is the numbers don't match up and you don't have to do them mathematically, but I think he edited this one a little bit. And that's another thing I forgot to say. Don't edit it to look, make it look like they match. I'll know, right? Because numbers don't lie. So he edited it to match. So why am I using an example? Because I kind of like it as a, not the way to do an example, but it's still decent. I'd give him, if both of them look like that, I'd probably give him a seven or an eight out of 10 on that, right? Because um, at least he got the right idea. He's setting it up right. He's got him framed the right way, but he was way off on his numbers. So the way I kind of grade it is if you try it and you just take, let's say you take 30 and 10 because you don't even go that, like, and I've seen that a lot, unfortunately. I might give you a three, even though you took 30 photos because you just totally didn't do it the right way. If you just focus on two different things, I might give you a three or a four because you're not doing it the right way. Now, if you start to do it the right way, but your numbers are way off and you edit your way out of it, I might give you a six or something, but not if generally I, I'm still a little lean, you know, not too good about that. And why am I saying all this? I'm just giving you an idea of the, how to do the assignment. If you do it and you just go five, six, 11, 16 or five, six, eight, 11, 16, and then the other way with the shutter speeds, boom, boom, 10 out of 10. But it's very precise. It's very, it's, it, when you do, when I do it, if I shoot at five, six of the thousandth, I don't even need to, like I said, I don't even need to look at my light meter again. I just take my camera and change it to F16 and 125th, put it back up. I don't even need to, all I need to do is make sure I'm still in focus and boom, got it. It's a number thing. It doesn't, once you get the right exposure the first time, you're good. So I know I'm, I, I just want to make sure the other thing is you can't, like, I don't want you to edit. Like I would rather just see your walls. Cause if you edit, it's defeating the purpose of seeing if you got the exposures right in the first place. So uh, that's the other kind of thing on that. And um, minimum focal length. Yeah. Show examples. Yeah. Um, one other last thing, and then we're done is I want to talk about compression very quickly but compression, this is this is what compression does. And I have an example of it up on my Flickr. When I say compression, um, and again, we could go through some of these. And I have compression in my depth of field, but like this is Amy Grantonics, which we already saw. This one was really well done. This was last semester, a young man. He did a F11 at a 125th. And then... F4, because he used four, and you can go to four if you want to use four, F4 to 1,000. But those exactly match up, and you can tell by looking at the photos. You couldn't even tell hardly that I switched there unless you looked in the background. But look, boom, those are exactly the same exposures, exactly, because the numbers match. And all that changes is the depth of field. That's, that's the trick. So... The last thing I want to show you is compression. And what I mean by compression is this. These are just some little guys on my shelf in this room. This, I don't change the numbers at all in these, these two photographs you're about to see. Five, six of the 60th, ISO 1600, doesn't matter. It's just because I'm indoors, okay? But five, six of the 60th. Here, I'm farther away from this guy, this little doll thing, right? I'm farther away. And if you look, in the background, you see his little smile and his little eyes, Finn, right? You see him. I'm farther away, five, six of the 60th. Now watch. I just get closer. All I do is move my body closer. It's a 50 millimeter lens. Oh, it was an 85. It was a 56, but it's 85. Here, all I did was I got closer. And look now, he's blurry. I didn't change anything of my settings. Five, six of the 60th. 
okay? Five, six of the 60th. Farther away, things stay into focus. Things stay in, fo the focal plane is right here. So farther away, things stay in focus for a longer distance. Closer up, things start to fall apart, fall out of focus. So the closer you are to your subject, your focal plane, we all know what a focal plane, that's a question. Does anybody have quite, Does anybody have trouble focusing? Because a focal plane can be anything in the photo. You, if someone, if looking at me right now, if you are focusing on me, on my nose or on my eyes, the focal plane is right here. Boom, focal plane. Just trying to make a flat wall here, focal plane. If you are focusing on, say the baby doll up there, that's about, I don't know, five feet behind me. If you're focusing on the baby doll back there, that's a different focal plane. Now, if I went like this, watch this. Focal plane here, let's put my finger up here and see if my camera will grab. Focal plane there, it'll make me start to look soft if I do it right. Yeah, a little bit, it's not great, but it'll start to make my head look soft. Um, but it's not really grabbing my fingers is the problem. The autofocus isn't working that well. The point is if I if I was focused on my hand here, my face would start to get blurry because now my focal plane is like right here. So the closer something is that you're focusing on, the faster the depth of field falls off behind it. That's distance to subject. Okay, so that's a big thing to know, to understand. Um, so I think that's it. Does anybody have any questions about that? It's It's complicated in a way, but it's... It's just a numbers thing. It's really the most complex thing in photography until you start getting into flash. And flash can be pretty complicated too. But um, aperture and compression, depth of field, the reasons to use it, the reasons not to use it, right? Um, yeah. So next week, Friday, do four photos. Shallow depth of field, deep depth of field, shallow depth of field, deep depth of field. Two different scenes. Do it outside. You'll get better results. It'll be easier. Okay. All right. So I'm going to stop recording and then just see if anybody has any questions about anything. And if not, um, oops, um, I'm going to stop recording. If you